Perhaps our most important collaborator back then in the early days was Wendy Carlos. And out of uh, those experiments came Switched On Bach, of course, which uh, then became the largest selling classical album of all time. The forces that went into the background of Switched On Bach were really based on something that happens every so often in, in history. It was a magical moment when the timing was right. Before 1968, the conventional wisdom in the music business, not the musical industry, but the music business, was that sure you could make funny sounds with electronics and you could do weird things, but you couldn't make real music. What was real music? Real music was uh, music that made real money. But Wendy Carlos uh, proved that wrong, she, uh, no uncertain terms. Bach seemed to be an ideal uh, uh, type of music to use because the multi-track tape recorder allows you to lay down one melodic line on top of another to form chords and, you know, all of the orchestrational things that one wishes to have. And the, um, the synthesizer itself at that time, don't forget, was one note at a time. And since you could only do one note at a time, and since most of Bach's music is one note at a time, it was like the perfect marriage of um, the right technology, the right techniques. And typically, when Wendy and I got together, she would tell me what we did wrong. She would tell me what she would, what she would like to see us do. And we would go back and do it. And uh, sometimes it took three or four times before we got it the way she liked it. He was the engineer who spoke music. I was the musician who spoke engineering terms. And together, we were able to come up with ideas that I don't think anyone would have come up with alone. A synthesizer is a device that makes a whole something, a whole sound or a whole piece of music out of component parts. And that's the way a musician thinks of a synthesizer. As this part changes the tone color, this part is the pitches, this part is the articulation, and so on. So when a musician works with the patch chords and sets the knobs, he is synthesizing a sound. Well, synthesizer, I've got my cake and eat it too. You see, I still have the same sounds that I had back when I was working with the Moog synthesizer. Remember the sine wave? We still have that. We also can do a very percussive one, one sort of a little more refined than we're able to do with the Moog synthesizer. From the same notes, listen to this one. And again, that last one is very quiet. But let's put those three together. And at the attack, let's add a little bit of noise. Now what we have here is a replica of the xylophone, and that's a sound that I never was able to get with the old synthesizer. Equal tempered scale, you know, it's the one that Grandma's piano was tuned to. It's the one we're all grown up to think of as being sort of sacrosanct or God-given, and uh, you know what it sounds like, and you can play in any key. They all sound equally as good, or equally as bad. Now I say equally as bad is, the reason is that these are compromises, they're mathematical compromises to allow the ability to change key to modulate, uh, but that's not designed to make all of the keys sound as good as they could sound. Now, uh, let's show you what they could sound like. The equal tempered scale playing this chord is very rough, a little dissonant. If I retune it by playing, in this case, I'm uh, using this auxiliary keyboard that I built, which is triggering a Hewlett Packard computer running a piece of software that I wrote, it's retuned the whole instrument now. That's how much smoother that is than the equal tempered scale. Now we have large scale integration, we have computers, uh, we, we have sophisticated software. Musicians are using all of it. They're using it as fast as, as can be developed. I think that computers and the software that's written for them are going to be the greatest thing for musicians since the invention of CatGut itself. Carlos has used her innovative tunings, timbres, and timings for the hauntingly lyrical Beauty and the Beast.
we can now have a democratization of music as has never occurred before, even with mom spinning in the uh, living room. Um, that was something where very few of, these, uh, of the children might learn how to play piano. But an awful lot of us are now going to be able to learn with our computers and with our keyboards how to play music. The more they'll be able to have an appetite for delicacies, uh, uh, for their sushi, for their Middle Eastern dishes, for things that they hadn't tried before, their appetites will be broadened and they'll be able to understand and love uh, a deeper range of real masterpieces that are in the future. In fact, um, the technologies are moving very far forward and a lot of the music which I may belittle as being a little bit plastic fantastic, you know, the commercial types of uses of this, which don't have any imagination, which don't use the new tunings, which are doing just the sort of the sampling kind of easy things to do, which aren't getting to the nitty gritty. Nonetheless, they are sponsoring an industry which slowly is broadening its horizons, maybe kicking and screaming all the way, but it's moving forward and it's going to happen. It'll be happening before before the end of this millennia is out, we'll be able to then do any kind of possible music without really thinking about the, the, the hardware, and it will then be the composer, the musician that counts, won't be the technology.